Hi, welcome to another Expert Insights discussion. Today, we're joined by Stephanie Smith from Cogwheel Marketing, one of our expert partners. In this discussion, we explore how hotel sales and marketing can seem disconnected when looking at how to drive top line revenue. With the continual change in traveler behavior and how they go about researching and subsequently booking their travel, it is more imperative than ever that hotels take a balanced and strategic view of how they market to both their transient and group business. Stephanie feels hoteliers in particular sales and marketing do not approach these markets in quite the same way. Through this conversation, she outlines 10 areas to challenge your current thinking and lays out a simple point scoring game you can play to see if you do indeed adopt a balanced approach or maybe not. Hope you enjoy the conversation. What will you score? Hey, Stephanie, uh, good to see you again. Great to have you join us. How are, how are things with you? Okay. Everything's awesome. Thanks for having me today, Trevor. <laughs> You're welcome. Now, why have we got you on this conversation? Well, apart from the fact that every time I talk to you, it's always interesting. It was, we were talking a couple of weeks ago, just catching up, and you just happened to make a couple of comments that when I came off that discussion, I just thought, um, that's in that's interesting. I want to explore that a bit more. And what we were talking about, you were you were just talking about, yeah, we were just catching up and you were just saying how now everyone's kind of full on deep into their budgeting, forecasting periods, maybe even got them completed by now. And then you made this statement, which was you know, kind of like a throwaway as part of our conversation, which was that you feel there's this this disconnect, real disconnect between um, kind of sales and marketing, but how sales are forecasting their business. And I, I was trying to pull those threads together and I thought, well, rather than trying to work it out myself, why don't I just ask you? So what were you, in the context of that forecasting and sales and group business and transient, what were you alluding to when you kind of made that, when you made that comment? Yeah, I mean, I've been talking with uh, quite a few, especially on the um, above property, but it definitely trickles down in on property. But, you know, when we start looking at budget season and, you know, usually you're sitting down with your budget and you're, you know, looking at, you know, your entire top line revenue goals going into 2024. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, we got to work backwards. How are we going to reach those goals? So I went through an exercise with a couple of different companies where I was like, um, you know, I'm talking to a a, a DOS who probably also oversees marketing in some capacity, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever that may or may not entail. And I have them go through a little exercise and I say, okay, get your, get a little sheet of paper. And I say, just write for 2024, what your top line revenue goals are. Um, and then draw a line straight down the middle. And then on one side, put what your group goals are and on the other side, put what your transient goals are. So if you've got you know, different hotels have different business mixes. So yeah. maybe it's a 70-30, maybe it's a 60-40, maybe it's a 50-50, right? But whatever that is, it's a pretty simple equation. Most people can kind of kind of work backwards based on their group goals. So like 10 um, million top line, I'm a 70-30 mix, seven, 7 million on one side, 3 million on the other, right down the middle. Yeah, yeah. so depending on whatever your ratio is. Yeah. So depending yeah. on how group heavy, you know, your hotel might yeah. kind of lean towards, right? So, and I said, okay, in the column where your group goals are, you're going to write down all your strategies, everything that you're, that you're allocating to meet those group goals. You've got, you know, you've got a sales team of some size. You're probably going to some conferences. You might be doing, you know, some other, you know, some other initiatives with CVAN or whatever the case may be. So on the group side, you've got all these things and you, you know, total up because that's what you're going to do to reach that group goal. Now on the transient side, I want you to go through the exact same exercise. What is it that you're, um, what is it that you're going to do to meet those transient goals? Yeah. And then that sheet of the, the side of the paper is blank. Or they look at me <laughs> as the marketing person and say, oh, well, you know, you and revenue management are going to fill up that side of the column. And I'm like, well, if you didn't give me any money to do that, um, or you gave me a very, you know, proportionately, if you look at the investment you've made on the group side versus your investment on the transient, don't we look a little bit lopsided? <laughs> um, and they all kind of look at me and I, I mean, you kind of go into this knowing what the answer is going to be, but it's a very, um, it's very clear. Cause I mean, I think traditionally a lot of DOSs probably got promoted into their, you know, 
role because they were good at booking group sales. So it's a mm -hmm. comfort zone for them. But then when they get into the role where they have to oversee all of top line, then they're like, well, this over here, the group side is what I'm good at. This is what I know. This is what I can lead my team on. But then they're also responsible for the other half of the equation and it's it's uncomfortable for them. And, and I guess in a way, the group and I, you know, straight out there, never been in hotel sales. So uh, probably loads of comments or feedback so you don't know what you're talking about and I, I get that but to me when I think about it the transient bit seems like well I'd, you know out there somewhere what can I do can I control it can I influence it whereas groups I've got a list of prospects I kind of know what I'm going to do I know where I'm targeting I know what events I can get it seems slightly more straightforward to be able to compartmentalize and get my head around um is that it seems more within their control right it seems yeah, like yeah. a more direct a more direct relationship like if i do x y will happen right yeah 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 no that makes sense and so i i guess one of the other one of the other questions that i look at is that from from a group perspective, you're dealing, you know, again, if you've come from that background, you probably know those clients, you know, the type of events that they're that they're looking for, or the types of business that they're after. Again, you seem to be able to get a handle on it. From the transient side, and I think this is changing a bit in groups as well, initially from the inquiries, but the actual, um, the actual way that people are now engaging making choices around how they are booking where they are booking has dramatically changed and was changing anyhow and then obviously post pandemic has just changed again you could argue and and when we were chatting you were just again when we were talking off the cuff you were just throwing out some statistics of things that you have done through these exercises can you talk a little bit to some of the you know just some of those headline areas that that influence uh, that demonstrate how that has changed yeah and we'll have to share um expedia does these um kind of like quarterly um i don't know infographics or kind of reports that they do we'll have to drop that in the show notes but the one they did um just a few months back was you know really understanding that customer journey and this is on the both and the group transient side but when you look at when we when we, a lot of hoteliers tend to look, use our RMS, our revenue management system, to focus on that point of booking. What this Expedia report shows is how many days it takes when it when they've actually decided to make the transaction or decided to book at this hotel. That's a very quick decision. The actual, you know, process of making the reservation is a, you know, is you know, very very straightforward. But what it basically yep. showed was how many days, weeks, and months leading up until that transaction. Um, how that customer journey, customer journey is very, it's all the different touch points happening up until that point, right? Mm -hmm. So if we only look at our RMS and what our pickups been and what we have on the books, then we're missing everything that happens up until that point. So sure. yeah, yeah, we kind of yeah. we kind of say, okay, this has happened. Yeah. We think of it; it's going to happen in the future because of the booking for the future, but it's already happened. They've kind of booked already. They made the decision. yeah. The reservations it's, made it's now. That, at this yeah, point. it's that decision process you're referring to. Yeah. And the other thing that they kind of walk you through in the Expedia is they're looking at, um, you know, whether you're booking, you know, a hotel or airline or car rental and all the different touch points. So we've, you know, we've all heard about, you know, that inspiration phase versus the consideration phase. But mm -hmm. it basically says during each pieces of this customer journey, um, how much of an impact it has. So like one of the, you know, diagrams that they have it shows that 77 percent of travelers are influenced by social media i think everybody knows that everybody knows that you know everybody's consuming some type of social media mm -hmm. um first of all 77 percent is a very high statistic but when it comes down to the actual point of transaction social media is almost at zero so that means there'll be an influence along the way but when it comes to transactional at the point of booking they're not using social media to actually transact so a lot there's you. always this you know, if we're running social media campaigns, there's always this disconnect where the owner's like, well, what was my return on ad spend? Well, I say, well, it's not like people were scrolling through their Facebook feed and they're like, let me stop what I'm doing and make this reservation. Like there was a whole lot that happened up until that point of making the reservation yeah. that we have to influence yeah. before we ask them to give us their credit card. Got you. That gotcha. Makes that makes sense. Yeah. And I guess within that social media space, you're looking at, you're looking at things like, um, uh, 
travel bloggers where does review sites and stuff like stuff like that come into play uh, well, this particular report categorizes in a lot of different ways. I think um, blogs is a separate um, category on there. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but it has like your own website. It's got the meta search. So it's got it really tiered into a lot of different places. And that's where in our pre previous conversation, we've talked about that whole ecosphere of what is the, the total online presence look like. And yep. that diagram really details all the different places where you have to be ready um, and on the shelf and impacting that customer journey. I've got you. And I think as well, one of the things that um, that stuck with me that you mentioned is that I think there were there were there were two stats that I'd made. a I was looking back, I'd made a note of is that one, I think it was an old stat. And I don't know if it's changed, but that consumers and this I think you're implying now could be transient or groups that they would look at like 38 different sites before actually booking or 38. Yeah, 38 different sites and that nearly three in five travelers did not have a specific destination in mind when they first got into that exploratory phase. Did did I make a note yeah. of those? Yeah, right. both of those are kind of mind blowing. I think the the number of sites they visit is depending on that segment, right? If I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess I'll look at it from a personal standpoint. If I'm, you know, going to a conference, you know, I'm, I might look at two sites before I make the transaction. If I'm booking a family vacation, I might look at more than you know, more than that. So you yeah. really have to look at it from a segmentation standpoint. But I think no matter what, you know, looking, not having that specific destination in mind is a really hard thing, you know, from a marketing standpoint for, for us, because you're like, you're looking at it, you know, there's so many factors that go into play, some of which you control and some of them, which you don't. I mean, we were just planning our own company retreat, um, you know, and granted it's, 12 room nights, but we still have to be, but we're coming all from the United, you know, all across the United States and Canada. So we're like, there's so many logistics that go into how do you choose a destination? Yeah. Um, and how do you influence that purchase decision um, based on the destination, based on the hotel, based on, you know, logistics of travel and all that that goes in. Um, and I think it's just important for people to realize a lot of that, that buying decision happens so much earlier than you think that it does. Um, one of the things that, and and this is then what I came away, and you 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 shared a little bit more information of some of these exercises that you'd been doing with some clients, is that what when I was kept connecting these dots and thinking, well, we feel we've got the, a, a greater grasp on the group's business, maybe less so on the transient business, but maybe there's some assumptions in that as well. And maybe we're still operating the way we always had done. Are we recognizing how much the customer, whoever that customer might be, how their choices or their engagement in those early phases might have changed? And so and, and there was there was something that you'd written in one of these um, information you'd sent over to me, which was ab about being on a being on the shelf. You've got to be on the shelf. And, and I kind of looked at it and thought, well, You've got two products, your transient product, your group product, and you've got lots of different shelves you've got to be on because you've got to be, you know, now you've got to be in all of these places. And it was to your point, that word that you used before, the ecosystem that we've touched on previously. I mean, it, it, it's it's a lot more complex. So how do you have you been able to, like, distill that complexity down into like some solid points when you work with your with you when you work with your clients and say okay these are like the shelves you need to be on or these are the things you need to consider yeah and i think the mindset that i'm just kind of trying to break um but, i mean it's been like this for years so pre-pandemic <laughs> post you know but you know good luck with changing like, it we're, we're talking here on that we're here talking on the eighth of the month so i get the panic email or the panic call from somebody on property that's like oh no my hotel is not going to meet budget I'm behind pace. And I'm like, you should have, first of all, you should have known this long before the middle of the month before you call, yeah, you know? And I'm like, if we're not, some of the time, we do have some tactics, some, you know, tools in our toolbox that we can employ to catch that low hanging fruit. But what we've, at this point in the month, we've already negated, you know, the first, you know, couple weeks, couple months of that journey. So it's a very last minute thing to be like, okay, so if we're not already on the shelf, it's hard for me to you know, if you're buying a car to manufacture it from the ground up and get it on the parking lot by the time you're ready to buy it. So it's the same mm -hmm. thing with hotels. Like a lot of these, you know, if we're not hitting them at the different points in the 
in that journey, it's kind of too late by the middle of the month to, to do a lot. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So what kind of what kind of tactics? I mean, you use the word there, tactics that you have. What kind of what kind of things when you're talking to, you know, if you were recommending to clients and maybe let's go to your point there, you know, you can't maybe change anything next week or maybe even next month, but you there are some things you could start to consider and do to help you understand, are you on the right shelf? <laughs> are you, you know, are you on the shelf for groups? Are you on the shelf for transient? You know, all these different shelves. Are there some tactics that you go through or will work through with your clients that you can that you could share? Yeah. And for my competitive um, people out there, a lot of people, especially on the sales side, are pretty competitive. I do this little exercise to see if they're on the shelf on both sides. So it's a kind of a pointing. It's a game where you can see how many times you score points. So okay. <laughs> I have right. So I have basically 10 tactics. And each component had most of them have a group and a transient side. So to kind of get both sides of the brain thinking, you know, you can get a half a point for a group, a half a point for a transient. So you can get up to 10 points. Um, you know, I've never had anybody get 10 points. I actually rarely have people, once you add up the half points, you know, most people, you know, are, are lucky to get five. But it's a good way to just kind of think, you know, if you're comfortable in the group side and you're doing on the group side, here's how to do it on the transient or vice versa. So you're saying so. They, they could get 10 out of 10 if they got both sides covered in these 10 tactics. But the challenge that you've laid down is that most that you're dealing with score five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. And it's a found, it's a foundation, right? You got to kind of, you got to, you got to have gotta layer the, it you up. can't, you can't like accelerate straight. What is that? You got to walk before you run. You can't yeah, yeah, go yeah. straight into sprints, right? You got to kind of work on it. But so we'll start out with kind of some of the quote unquote easier ones. Yep. Um, and then kind of build upon those tactics as we go. So what would, what would be, what would be, where would you start? Um, so the first piece I would start was just, you know, inspiring content and video. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, a lot of people have great images to this point, you know, video is still a struggle. Um, so there's an opportunity there, but on the group and the transient side. So a lot of times, you know, we have great pictures of our room product, great pictures of our lobby, but are we doing the same thing in terms of helping, you know, the, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk with, you know, the, the, I have to clean that up. Um, it's been a the traditional time. meeting planner has evolved. So a lot of the people that are booking events and stuff um, aren't your seasoned meeting planners. So they're going to use a lot of the same um, tactics when they, as a transient person looks at. So, you know, are we painting a picture yep. um, using imagery and video of what the meeting space could be? So instead of us having a big shot of our ballroom with empty chairs, how are we let you know allowing them to visualize what our space can be um That's and doing point. that on a more regular basis versus just those standard you know hotel ballroom shots that we have yeah no that makes sense so that's so that's the uh content content video next tactic yeah. so we they, yeah. so they've got to see okay they might score half a point for having videos and imagery for the transient but they might lose half a point because they haven't got anything on the group side yeah <laughs> you know, how are we, you know, sharing what we consider a successful event, um, things like that. So the next tactic um, is look, you know, leveraging social campaigns. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, um, I'll be the first to say social isn't going to be right for every hotel. So you got to yep. make sure it's worth the time investment. But again, we can look at this from a group and a transient standpoint. So a lot of times our followers um, on our social campaigns are going to be transient, but uh, on the social side, are we leveraging um, you know, are we leveraging LinkedIn from a group standpoint? Yeah, good from point. also, you know, from a paid side, we can target transient travelers, but we can also target group. Like we can target, you know, weddings or, you know, baby showers, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, holiday parties, things like, you know, leveraging paid to drive RFPs through social. So targeting, mm -hmm. again, that less seasoned meeting planner that might be your, you know, admin at some corporate office. Yeah. That makes sense. And um, I mean, from a marketing point of view, that's kind of almost a, a not reactive is the wrong word, but I guess, where does email come into this? Because that's obviously one that you can be quite targeted about. Yeah. So there's a lot of different levers to pull with email. And, you know, our company, Cago Marketing, we do a lot of support for branded hotels and they think that they can't do anything with email, but there's definitely some opportunities. 
I'm on both the group and transient side. Um, so we work with some, we've had some really good results with like awareness campaigns through email, especially for new openings and conversions to um, target transient groups, um, transient travelers. But, you know, you can participate outside of C-Event. You can do things like ePro Direct and Convention Planet. Um, and then you also have your own CRM. So on the group side, you know, how are you leveraging your, you know, Delphi or whatever CRM that you're using on the group side to continue those communications um, outside of doing any type of CRM, you know, th email marketing through your PMS. So there's a lot of different levers you can pull if you kind of look at it from a group and transient and look at what databases you do and don't have and then how you can supplement that. I would, I would think, I mean, I would imagine that's an area on the email side of things where most hotels will score a full point, wouldn't they? They'll, they'll have their database with their groups, their database, their CRM for the, the transient, and they're always emailed. You would think so. Marked. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. All right. <laughs> where, do, where, where does um, the whole uh, Google pay-per-click search engine marketing where does is is where does that where does that come yeah if anything i would think this would probably more people would score points on this so tactic number four okay. yep. you know is leveraging search engine marketing and ppc so this is you know really looking at people you know targeting when you look at that customer journey a lot of times people are kind of in market so looking at that consideration phase um so where i think a lot of hotels probably do well is they're buying they're investing in some type of pay-per-click you know, hotels near XYZ, hotels in XYZ city, things like that. Um, and then obviously some of their branded terms, but it's definitely something you can do on the group side as well. So, you know, people looking for specific event venues and things like that. Um, and then coupling that, you know, to go kind of a layer deeper on both the group and transient side, looking, honing in on, you know, what are your feeder markets, what direct flights you have. So you make sure that um, you're looking for people and aligning with people that are likely to come to your market just based on ease of travel. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So so far you've covered off uh, content, inspiring content videos, social campaigns, email marketing, search engine marketing, PP, PPC. That's for what's 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 coming fifth. Um, number five, I think this is you know something. Hopefully, somebody will get points on on their scoreboard. But the consistent storytelling. So, um, you know, when we talked about one with the inspiring content and video, mm -hmm. um, I think there's a piece of, um, you know, making sure that your website, your own website, direct channels have the best story, so to speak. But we need to carry that through with those regular um, audits. So how are we telling that story on Expedia, on booking, on Cvent, um, on any of our other third party listings, our CVBs, our, you know, if we're, you know, there's other kind of, Cvent type website. So how are we leveraging those sites? So I have the opinion, you're like, yes, we want everybody to book through to direct. We want everybody to go direct. But there's certain consumers that we just have to be, again, on the shelf on those third-party platforms, whether we like it or not, because that's what they're going to use. Yeah. So as much as you want to bring them in direct, you know, if they choose to use a third-party channel, whether it's on the group or transient side, like an OTA or Cvent, then it is what it is. Like you just have to you know, be ready and have yeah. the best presence there you can as possible. It, it's it, back to our analogy of being on the shelf. You know, the, we may not want to have our products on that particular shelf, but if that's where the customers are going shopping, we have to put it on the shelf, don't we? And work, work yes, and then maybe do something else around it. Quick question on that, because I think two things struck me there is that um, I guess one was the word c consistent, and that is across the channels. And I think sometimes keeping that consistent and fresh can often be a challenge. I guess the the second thing that struck me is I could imagine back to like our video piece, it, it would seem easier to be storytelling and maybe more consistent about our storytelling in areas where our transient business might be and maybe less so with our guest stories. That a, a, a very big, poor assumption on my part. No, I think it's a good assumption. I think you know, it, I feel like sometimes we don't address some of these things until it's a problem. So we don't realize that, you know, <laughs> yeah. we're inconsistent or have a poor, you know, a poor image or something until somebody complains about it. Right. So yeah. the I think the other piece of that is being proactive about mm -hmm. um, addressing some of these things and looking at it from a 30,000 foot. Yeah, yeah, know. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. 
Okay, so that was uh, that was number five around our consistent storytelling. What's number six? So number six is my one of my predictions going into twenty twenty four. Um, <laughs> and that's around leveraging, you know, thinking about all the different touch points that we have, um, front desk usually being the main one, but we have so many more opportunities to touch the guests. So I feel like we're finally evolving where like our F and B operations and our outlets are actually a value add versus this redheaded stepchild that we have to have as an amenity to check a box. <laughs> um, so, you know, I've seen, um, we've had a lot of good conversations with, companies who are leaning in towards, you know, getting in front of the local community to help with the F&B outlets. So being a part of the community, because um, traditionally hotel restaurants were for just the people staying at the hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but there's also ways on the free side that you can do this from an event activation standpoint. You know, so if you're doing, you know, live music or happy hours, um, you can be leveraging those through Google My Business events and also Facebook um, event. So if people are looking for, you know, things to do near, near me this weekend, or um, those will come up um, on search. And those are actually free things that we can do. Um, but it also applies to, you know, like we had a hotel um, that was doing, you know, like a sales blitz, um, you know, kind of an event for, a, um, you know, like a VIP event. So we were trying to leverage some of those other opportunities just to kind of, again, put us on the shelf and some of those maybe less thought of or more transient ways of thinking when it comes to group. And then also just, you know, leveraging packages that come along with it. So I think a lot of people have the free breakfast package or something like that. But I mean, people, they're looking for an experience and F&B is where you can really provide that experience. Yeah. It's really hard to give this mind blowing chicken experience, but the, the you know, the F&B side of things is, a, is certainly an opportunity um, that, to help. How does that balance with the when you when you're talking with our two scores? So again, our half point on the transient, half point on the groups. How does that? How do you key key into that with the F and B events on the on the group side of things? Well, I think that um, you know when you look at, I think different people calculate top line revenue differently, but I think um, you know I think the ancillary revenue should be part of looking at total top line. So I think a lot of People, especially on the sales side, don't think about that ancillary revenue as part of the total package. But I also mm -hmm. think they need to realize that meeting planners want the full experience, right? So okay, if you've got, yeah. you know, the, and it's kind of a, you know, your restaurant still matters to the people. Your, your meeting planner is going to look at that hotel as a total experience package too. Got you. Got you. That makes sense. And you mentioned there about um, on that six using the F&B event and you, you spoke about, um, yeah, the, the 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 community and engaging the community and it's not just about the people out of town staying at your hotel i guess that and and your the next point i think you had was about local organizations strategic partnerships um how does yeah. how does that kind of tie in yeah i think number number seven like leveraging local partnerships and strategic partnerships in your market i mean it sounds it sounds you know basic but i think it's about how do we use those relationships that you have and as a salesperson, how do you leverage those to kind of extend into the online space to leverage that to reach more people in that customer journey? We, I was having a call actually this week with the hotel in New Orleans and both the GM and DOS had been longtime natives of New Orleans. And I'm like, that's it. You know more than you think you know about that. You know, once <laughs> you, you know, like, you know, all the hidden spots. So yeah. how does that, you know, I'm like telling this DOS, I'm like, you know, who the people are, right? I would assume at this point. So how are you, you know, like we, if I go to your CVB site, how many of these packages, how many of these experience packages are you putting into that space for that specific consumer that is using the CVB to research your destination? If you're looking at, um, you know, from a state tourism site, a lot of states have great um, state tourism sites. They've got their own events calendar. They've got their own experiences, their own newsletter. So they have their own, you know, audience that you can leverage on your behalf. So if you say, hey, I want to get in front of your audience, how can I, you know, utilize your captivative audience? And that's that's a group and a transient play. So CVBs, state tourism sites, they have a section for events and they have a section. So you got to look at it with two lenses, those partnerships with two lenses. Um, you know, the other piece of it that goes into any demand generators that we have and a lot of you know, traditional DOS, if you're focused on group, you're going to forget about, you know, maybe some of the museums you can partnership, 
with. You can, yeah. might forget about some of the colleges that might, you know, what are you doing for graduation weekends? What are you doing yeah, for point. move in dates? Things like that, mm -hmm. um, that we have to think about the transient side. Um, and who knows, maybe you get a BT account out of some of the, you know, out of some of those, when you're looking at through a transient lens, you might be able to pick up some BT accounts too. Yeah. It's interesting when you look at that, when you think of, when you, when you said local organizations and strategic partnerships, you think about businesses and that is group business, but you're right with you, with colleges, universities, museums, they could be group, but it's also tapping into the transient and finding partnerships with those businesses, but where they bring transient business into into the area. So no, that makes a lot of that makes a lot of sense. Um, so that was number seven: leverage local organisation strategic partnerships. What's number eight? Yeah. So this is you know if you're doing all the if you've scored really well and you've got your you know five to seven points up until this date, this is kind of. I would say kind of next level and you've got if you've got a decent budget you're working with, you know, how can you really target that top of funnel, um, really impact that inspiration phase? So early, early stage um, bookers. So on the you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can run display marketing. So this is, you know, if you're an you know, example, if you're looking on your news site, and you see an ad for a hotel that's usually going to come across as a display ad. Um, so there are different ways you can do that. So, you know, on a, if you're running a, a display campaign through Google, you can target by interest, you can target people, you know, that are coming to your market. But, um, you know, we've been using a lot of device ID um, campaigns of the late, so different data partners. So this is where it gets weird. You know, if you've got your cell phone, you can, you know, my cell phone, you know, they know that Stephanie Smith um, was at the, you know, at this concert on this date. Um, or they know that I went to XYZ conference on this date. So you can start to say, I want to target, like we've had on the group side, a hotel that's leveraged, you know, they can't afford to go to every IMAX and every other, you know, meeting planner event. So we actually use this technology to target people that we know that were meeting planners at those events. But oh, you can do the same thing on the transient side. So for aspirational you know, we have hotels whose aspirational comp set is not in their market. So they're competing against other destination hotels and other markets. Mm -hmm. So we're using that technology to leverage um, repeat guests of those to say, hey, if you like this resort, you'll also like ours. Um, oh, so nice. the, yeah, the level of targeting is really cool there. You can even, you know, exclude people that like, based on the patterns of the phone, they know that this person's an employee, and we're not going to way spending our money showing ads to people that you know are employees of this you know of this convention center or this hotel that's yeah i like i like that that that's kind of very pretty neat and kind of scary at the same time right <laughs> yeah we yeah that's kind of but they're always the fun ones though aren't they because they kind of get you <laughs> kind of get you close to a line okay um so that was device id which was number eight um what next one can we go to so I think um, number nine, we're going to do um, reviews. And yeah. I think a lot of people think about reviews as an operational tactic, but I think it's important, you know, that our sales teams realize that a transient and a meeting planner or group person actually going to look at the same thing. So they're going to look at, because they want to make sure their guests have a good experience. So just like how transient people read reviews, I also, there's, a statistic that said that um, reviews are the user generated reviews is the number two thing um, that people look for um, right. on the meeting planner side. So oh, it's okay. just as important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and I also think this is just, you know, me and my, my predictions, like I get very, there's all these websites that you can look at transient reviews. You can look at Google, you can look at Expedia, look at your own website. But there isn't any place for meeting planners to leave reviews. And I think we have this like coveted place where we don't share any of our group reviews internally because we know meeting planners talk. But I, I would love to see more hotels take advantage of LinkedIn to get meeting planners to leave reviews on their behalf and yeah. use that um, as kind of a sounding board, like a marketing you know, play to say, hey, like these people, look at the great experiences these people have and let those people be the storytellers for your hotel. And I, I guess as well, just connecting a couple of dots there back to the earlier about the videos and the storytelling you know you could put a generic video together around your meeting space but you can if you've got a review and they're okay for you to use the review you can then 
put the words and overlay that into so within the video itself you're getting reviews are coming up that people are seeing as they're as they're watching your video as well so you're you're kind of reinforcing that it's not just us promoting it but also here's some validation with people that have used this meeting space and enjoyed it so it's kind of linking those elements together isn't it yeah absolutely um and then the last thing the number 10 so we went through the top now now at the now at the Tenth, we're kind of bringing it all together and saying, hey, now we have to look and say, what's worked, what hasn't worked. So any, you know, marketing initiatives of the now that you're doing, you really have to evaluate them and say, you know, did we have the correct goals aligned? Did we have the right KPIs aligned? But now we have to say, you know, how do we say what's good and what's bad? So mm -hmm. how are you using your, how are you benchmarking yourself? Are you only benchmarking against your own self? Or are you benchmarking against, you know, a grander, you know, against looking outside of your own bubble. And we traditionally tend to look and say, okay, what was our return on ad spend? You know, how many impressions did we get? How many clicks did we get? Not that those metrics don't matter, but we really have to start saying, you know, how do we evolve what our scorecard looks like? What does our total online presence look like? You know, and self-servingly, we do have a product, Cogwheel Analytics, that brings it all together. So you can say, hey, you know, in this, in this digital space, how, how good is my online presence compared to other hotels? Yeah, that makes sense. And I guess that's a, it, it's an obvious factor, but I'd be interesting. It'll be interesting to know how many people score highly on really evaluating what has done well, what hasn't gone well, and making sure the relevant factors are, are properly aligned. And sometimes that also comes back to understanding what you want in the first place and what you're, what you're setting out. Because well, if you, yeah, because if you haven't set your goals, specifically enough or correctly aligned then when you evaluate it's obviously going to be going to be out of kilter isn't it yeah and I think a lot of times you can look at it and say you know what am I doing to reach people in each stage going back to that um, Expedia paper when you look and say you know between the inspiration down through booking down through stay how are we hitting people at each point of this customer journey so I think that's you know important to look at I think a lot of people probably, you know, have something like Demand 360 or Calibri Labs where they can say, you know, how is my, at a, at a basic level, how is my channel mix? So how am I, from an online standpoint, my website and my OTAs, how am I pacing against other hotels? So historically, am I getting my fair share? And then looking into the future, am I getting my fair share? So at a basic, I hope people are doing that, but I think it can go uh, much deeper than that and looking at the, you know, more details of each of the ecospheres we talked about. I think it's I think it's interesting. I can imagine when you when you go into one of your one of your hotel clients and say, right, okay, and you ask them those upfront questions and get them just very simply, okay, put out what your top line revenue is, how are you gonna do it? Right, now score how you're working against these 10 tactics. But uh, but there must be, you know, you can imagine some of the light bulbs that are going on, but then coming out of that, having a clear identify where are the areas where there's there's good things that are going on that can be solidified and built on and where are the gaps that obviously need to be need to be rectified um sometimes you just need you just need that cut through of the clarity don't you yeah well you got to have the you got to have the mindset to say okay i'm going to do something to modify my strategy before you can start using those tactics right we got to make sure we have a lot of people want to jump straight into tactics and we haven't thought about what our strategy is. Who do we yeah, want to go after? Point. What segments do we, are we not getting our fair share? You know, what are our goals um, and how are we going to meet them? So you got to have to do that foundational strategy work before you can jump into those tactics too. <laughs> well, be, be interesting. We, we don't normally ask for lots of comments on our videos because we're kind of not one of these, uh, you know, you know, funky cat videos or something that people are going to comment <laughs> comment on but but maybe who knows maybe someone that watches this actually goes and does the exercise and is brave enough to put in the comments what score they got if it wasn't 10 <laughs> well, well, well how about well, if somebody <laughs> wants to share their they can we can bring them on and have another discussion and they can say how how well they scored and you know how how that is that um how is that kind of come through in their star reports how does that come through and they're kind of meeting their top line goals yeah that'd be that'd be a really good thing get get them together get you together have a conversation around it that would be very useful be fun absolutely yeah. well look i don't want to take up any more of your time thanks thanks for that as i say it started by us just having a catch-up conversation 
and then a whole idea spun out of it. Um, but I can I, I can understand where that what you meant now by that disconnect between the sales and the marketing and okay, here's a number, but how are you going to get there? And are you are you on all the shelves and are you doing the right thing? So thanks for sharing those techniques always uh, and tactics. Always a pleasure. Great to talk with you. Thanks, Trevor. Well, I hope that conversation was of interest and thanks again to Stephanie for joining us. If you have any thoughts or views on this conversation, please feel free to comment below, maybe even put down what you scored. If you like the discussion, also, please don't forget a thumbs up. And if you're interested in more of our videos, here is a link to our Expert Insights playlist. And here is the link to our Coffee Time Chat playlist. And here is the button if you'd like to subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos. Thanks again for watching.